Well, thank you so much. Thank you for, for the introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great honour to be here um, and especially to participate in this, this really extraordinary project. Um, I, I'm going to be talking about substantive equality. Um, the right to equality is ubiquitous in international human rights documents and in bills of rights in, in constitutional human rights law. And it has been <coughs> elaborated in the European Union from, from the early days of the right to equal pay in the Treaty of Rome um, and manifested itself in different kinds of ways ever since then. Um, what I want to do is frame a concept of substantive equality by trying to pull together uh, different understandings of equality in order to get uh, a framework of analysis as to how we can understand and apply substantive equality. Um, so we already have what I would call glimmers or manifestations of substantive equality in various concepts uh, through which the right to equality have been elaborated, both in the EU and more generally in human rights law. So these would be familiar indirect discrimination, affirmative action, internationally might be called special measures, reasonable accommodation, equal pay for work of equal value. So can we take these glimmers, as it were, and um, bring them into a fully-fledged notion of substantive equality? <coughs> Um, but in order to do that, we need to look back at where it is we're coming from and what are the problems which we want to address through a concept of substantive equality. And that requires us to look back at what we might call formal equality, which is usually counterposed to substantive. Um, and again, this, these critiques are quite familiar, but it's worthwhile bringing them together so that we can see we can evaluate our concept of substantive equality as against what we understand by formal equality. So we, can, we, can, we generally think about formal equality in two ways. One is equality before the law. And I'm going to be talking or framing this discussion in terms of gender. But I, I, I think, and I, I have applied this framework to other grounds and also to intersectional grounds. But if we think about gender, then clearly the struggles of women for equality before the law in, in Europe took place largely in the 20th century. But actually it's, it's quite astounding in how many countries in the world formal equality before the law has not been achieved. And I've been doing some research internationally, um, looking at CEDAW reports and others. And in, in a significant number of countries still, Women uh, under customary law, under personal law, family law, do not have formal equality before the law. But once we achieved equality before the law in, in Europe, <coughs> it became clear that that was clearly not sufficient. And we needed to have an anti-discrimination framework, which also included private, um, the way in which private people treated each other. So this is the other way which we think about formal equality, treating likes alike. And the important aims of this, which we also shouldn't lose sight of, are firstly to treat everyone consistently, but importantly that we should try and strip away prejudice and the kind of treatment which is based on what we've now come to consider irrelevant characteristics such as gender. And the aim was to somehow expose the individual, we could treat everyone as an individual on the basis of their merit. But as, as we all know who have been working in the equality field, this is a very, turns out to be a very limited concept. And really the basis of thinking about substantive equality is to see to what extent we can move beyond the concept of treating likes alike. So just a, a, a brief sketch of some of those limitations. So, so we, we, the first thing we want to ask is, um, who is relevantly alike? So the first side of the equation is you first have to, to decide who is alike before you can treat them alike. And the problem of the comparator has been endemic. So who do we compare with in order to find less favourable treatment? And probably the most florid 
is in the case of pregnancy, starting with this very absurd notion of could we find a pregnant man, and if we can't, there's no likes to be treated alike. And then moving on to seeing pregnancy as a kind of illness, until eventually we, we needed to move away from the comparator altogether for the pregnancy issue. But in the US, uh, in the US law, there is still a central notion of treating pregnancy uh, as equivalent to illness. Um, but even if we can decide who is relevantly alike, we need to ask even further, why do we need people to be alike in order to qualify for the right to equality? And it means that we're trying to iron out difference, wash out any diversity and identity, and in the end, this individual who we're trying to strip away and regard on individual merit turns out to be the paradigm male norm. And only if you conform to the white male, able-bodied, etc. norm do you, do you come into the concept, this concept of equality. Um, and even if we get beyond the first side of the formula, treating likes alike, we want to ask, is like treatment sufficient? And wouldn't it be better to have better treatment in order to deal with disadvantage in certain circumstances. Um, fourthly, as long as you treat everyone the same, it doesn't matter if they're treated equally well or equally badly. So we have had cases of um, courts in various places accepting that if you take away someone's privilege, so-called privileges, you've achieved equality. And there's the famous case of Jackson in the US where in order, when the court ordered the local authority to desegregate swimming pools, they closed down all the swimming pools so that nobody had access to swimming pools. Um, and finally, of course, the whole concept of merit needs to be rethought because merit is itself a kind of a social construct. So how do we move beyond that to achieving a substantive equality? Um, and again, there have been various candidates We've looked at equal opportunity, and equal op the important part of equal opportunity is that it can take into account previous disadvantage. So it talks about equalizing the starting point. But, or we could think about equality of results. If we, rather than equalizing the starting point, we try and equalize the end point. So we look at who actually wins the race. Equal opportunity, we say, we put everyone on an equal footing and then some will win and some will lose. Um, these all have important merits to them, but are problematic to the extent <coughs> of vagueness. What do we mean by opportunity? We could remove barriers at the demand side, that is, we can say we will accept everybody regardless of their gender, but really we need something much, much more substantive which is to provide the kind of resources which can actually bring everyone to the starting point. And equality of opportunity has never really got there. Um, with e equality of results, which is popular because it's easy to quantify. Um, we nevertheless need some idea of what are the results. Which results do we look at? And generally, particularly in Europe, we tend to look at the labour market for women rather than looking at the home. Um, and it also means um, results can be deceptive because you might um, have a change in the composition of the labour market, but qualitatively there may not be a change. And so we find much, a lot across the board really in Europe, many, many more women participating in the workforce, but generally speaking, still on very inferior terms, if we take global figures like that. Um, another key candidate has been dignity. And many jurisdictions really favor dignity as the core of substantive equality. So this is a quote from the Canadian court, um, which, and the South African court similarly sees dignity <coughs> as the key to um, an idea of equality. Um, and similarly, the, in the EU Charter, Article 1 says human dignity is inviolable. If we look at the provision for equality for the elderly, that's also framed around dignity. And um, 
the way in which sexual harassment was developed was through a focus on dignity. So dignity has itself um, been key, uh, a part of development of standard equality. But dignity is also problematic if we try and reduce equality entirely to dignity. Because if we look more closely at dignity, of course, it's not necessarily an egalitarian concept. It's based in a dignitarian view, which was originally about hierarchy. So we still need to talk about equal dignity, which means we have to come back to the equality side of it. And in any event, what we found through jurisprudence in various jurisdictions, such as Canada, the UK, and South Africa, if we take dignity on its own, we can land up divorcing it from the real issues of disadvantage. And so we get in all these three cases in different jurisdictions, courts saying that although we've removed benefits from people, uh, although we haven't given benefits to other people, that didn't really mean we regarded them as any less worthy. So it didn't breach equality. And that's problematic. Um, and then, of course, dignity is vague enough to support arguments on both sides. So in some cases, and Hugo is a South African case, which is really worth looking at, because both the majority and the dissent talk about dignity in order to um, support their position. So what I've tried to do is bring together the best of all of these concepts and also use different <coughs> parts of these concepts to buttress each other. And from that to derive a four-dimensional con uh, concept of substantive equality, which brings in various different aspects and uses aspects to make sure that we don't have the difficulties that I've outlined. And I've, I've, I've derived four, what I call four dimensions, and I call them dimensions because they aren't in any kind of lexical priority. They're meant to be... Um, thickening up the concept, as it were, or uh, reinforcing each other. So the first is what we might call a redistribution dimension. And that is to say, equality is about redressing disadvantage. Um, but it's disadvantage associated with, in, this, in the case that I'm talking about, <coughs> gender, but could be other status groups. Um, but that's not, not enough, because really, particularly for gender, we need to see disadvantage as centrally linked to the ways in which women are, are, are configured, the roles, the stereotypes attached to women. And so the dignity concept comes in, in a different way as a second dimension. It comes in um, as a focus on promoting dignity and worth, but redressing stereotyping, stigma, humiliation, and violence. And this interacts with the disadvantage dimension in order to make sure that when we look at women's disadvantage in the workforce, we see it as centrally linked to the stereotypes and the fixed roles which women remain cast <coughs> in. Um, but these two are not enough in themselves, and, what, and generally much too little uh, focus has been given, <coughs> emphasis has been given to the importance of participation. So the third dimension is about participation. We could bring this in under redressing disadvantage, but disadvantage isn't only, isn't really about representativeness or decision making. So participation and voice is, uh, should really be seen separately. And the the fourth is what we might call transformational. Now this packs in, this has two different sides. The one is to move away from the idea of conformity, <coughs> which we saw as a central critique in the, uh, like the equal treatment paradigm. And to say that difference is important and difference is valuable. So identity is valuable. The problem is when detriment is attached to that difference. So we want to still be able to retain <coughs> difference, and in order to retain difference, we need to be able to change structures of society. In the context of women in particular, of gender, this requires us to see the extent to which ongoing disadvantage and stigma 
are part of the structure of society and the way in which institutions are made up. So we really can only move forward, um, I suppose one could say, holistically towards substantive equality if we see the importance of changing existing norms. So I'll say a little bit about each of these and then talk about their interaction and then very quickly say something about how we could apply it to current EU gender discrimination law. If we, as a start, looking at redressing disadvantage, the importance about this is that it's asymmetric. So we don't simply say we're getting rid of gender as classification. It means that we're only getting rid of the disadvantage attached to that. And that means we can straightforwardly have positive action and, um, well, affirmative action where necessary. We don't have to call them special measures. We don't have to call them exceptions. We can see them as, in themselves, part of equality. Um, now, in the EU, there's generally been a focus on labour force disadvantage. And generally, this dimension is about socio-economic disadvantage. So, the important, in fact, EU law has importantly used the redressing disadvantage dimension, or you can see it in EU law, in, the, in respect of the pay gap, job segregation, and the predominance in precarious work. But these are all issues which, if we have a dimension on redressing disadvantage, this is exactly where we need to focus our right to equality. But the problem is it's not enough because, as I said before, we need to, if we are really going to address job segregation, pay gap, predominance in precarious work, we need to see the division of labour in the home. And that's where redressing disadvantage on its own is not enough, and we also have to address lack of political or underrepresentation, let's call it, in decision making of women. So that brings us to the second dimension, which is um, redressing stigma, stereotyping, and violence. Now, as I said, this brings in um, the, the, the background principle of dignity that has been used, but it, it, I, I prefer to see it in, in terms of. Uh, recognition which comes from Hegel's understanding and has been very usefully developed by Nancy Fraser. And the usefulness of thinking about it as recognition is it's about how people see each other, how you are viewed in society. And that brings in a community dimension. This part is really a social issue. It's an issue of, of social interaction of how people understand each other and are, I mean, how people regard each other and are regarded by others. And therefore, as understanding gender as a social construction. Um, which means that if you are not recognized in, as, as a person, then that's a denigration and a breach. Um, now, particularly, there are two ways in which um, this recognition issue feeds back into disadvantage. The one is the, the sexualization of women, harassment and violence against women, which interferes clearly with their workforce participation, but in, interferes with them in themselves. And then women stereotyped as mothers um, and as sexual objects. So that's where this comes in, and I'll talk a bit more about the interaction. Um, the idea of participation this comes initially from the really important um, jurisprudence in the US, which <coughs> saw equality in, in the race context as being about, um, well, at least saw human rights even more generally, but particularly around rights to equality, saw it, uh, them as important be, as a substitute or as a, uh, as a replacement to the political process. So if you don't have proper political participation, then you are not able to achieve your rights through politics. But this takes us further and says you should be, um, really what equality should be doing is in improving or bringing people into the political <coughs> and the political decision making process. But also it's about social inclusion, not just at a, at a purely political level. And I just extracted the way in which we can see this already in the Charter, 
uh, for persons with disabilities, um, where it's both about benefiting from measures, but also about participating more generally in the life of the community. And the final transformative dimension is, as I said, about not so much difference, but detriment attached to difference. We need structural change, and particularly in the context of women, this needs to be thinking much more radically about the boundaries between paid and unpaid work, because women's ongoing primary responsibility for unpaid work, despite having entered into paid work, continues to drag women down in the labor force. Um, so as well as seeing women in the, in the workforce, radically we need to see much more about bringing men into the home. And this is, uh, would be a transformative uh, understanding. Um, also, of course, we would need to revalue women's work. And again, the recognition aspect, that is, women's stereotyping, has been central to the, the reality of the pay gap of women's work being undervalued. So a transformative approach would also require us to revalue women's work. So if we think about this as, as, as a dimensional concept, uh, just very, very briefly looking at the interaction between dimensions. So as I said, if we think of the second dimension, prejudice stereotyping, we can see the way in which that causes disadvantage through undervaluation of women's work. Um, on the other hand, sometimes they, the dimensions pull against each other, and this is very important for design and social policy. So if we look closely at, so, at certain social security programs, we find although they are focused on redressing disadvantage, they actually also um, pre, um, include or trigger further stigma. Um, and traditionally, well, in, in, uh, earlier on, in, or the, in the late 20th century, social security systems often cast women as dependents, um, and that needs to be changed if we are going to have both redressing disadvantage and stigma. And I've done some, some work on outside of Europe, really, on this very, uh, very popular now new thought about conditional cash transfers, which we could talk about more, but conditional cash transfers basically give cash transfers to mothers on condition that they take their children to health clinics, take their children to schools. So on the one hand it looks like it's redressing disadvantage, on the other hand it's emphasizing women as, a, as responsible for children and not men. So if we're going to design social security with a substantive equality understanding in mind, we need to bear this in mind. Um, thirdly, we could have, again, schemes which go towards redressing disadvantage but actually perpetuate structural inequality, so don't meet the fourth dimension. And again, we could um, talk more about this, but if you think we all struggled for maternity rights, which is a very important struggle, but actually we now need to see to make sure that maternity rights are matched by paternity rights in order not to keep the structural uh, basis of women being assumed to be primary child carers in place. And the same with part-time workers' rights. So the EU has made very important, really centrally important strides towards giving part-time workers equal rights, equal or rights to equal pay and, and so on. But what hasn't happened is that the structure of part-time work has changed. So Part-time workers are still predominantly women, and it, until we see a change in the, in the gender composition, that will remain an issue of inequality. Um, and then again, the accommodating difference on the basis of, say, religion could really interfere with the second dimension, which is recognition. <coughs> so we have to, again, work very hard on seeing how we can reconcile um, accepting religious and other identities with religion, with gender and sexual orientation. So finally, I thought, um, this will be my, my last slide, I would just show, and this is just very, very sketchy, um, and apologies for doing it very briefly, but I just thought I'd give a little taste of how we might 
apply this to EU gender discrimination law. Um, so when we look at it more, in more detail, we see a very uh, important gains on the interaction between the first dimension, which is redressing disadvantage, and the second, which is, uh, re which is redressing stigma, prejudice, stereotypes, and violence. From, the, from very early on, we've had the right to equal pay for work of equal value, uh, which recognises that the way in which women have been stereotyped has affected the valuation of women's work. Um, the same, the, the, the realisation by the Court of Part-Time Workers indirect discrimination, there is now a permission for affirmative action, which to some extent says that it, it's part of equality to have different treatment to achieve, uh, to redress disadvantage. Um, the recognition of harassment, sexual harassment based on dignity as affecting work in the labour force and as I said pregnancy rights. But on the other hand, and I, I, I've mentioned most of these things already, there is um, not enough attention to the third dimension which is participation and the fourth dimension which is more about structural change. The third dimension we could say political participation there have been policy moves at EU level, and the difficulty is, of course, competence, where the competence of the EU ends. And we could, so I won't talk much more about that, but if we think about the transformative one, um, <coughs> people care for work of equal value has been very important, but the court put the brakes on it, and it's had a limited impact on job segregation, because of this principle that it's only the person who's responsible for the pay who should be responsible for equalising pay. So we are still bound to a uh, comparison between women and men broadly in the same um, establishment or occupation or employment broadly. Um, again, as I said, even though we see part-time work as indirect discrimination, there is no effect on women's primary responsibility for childcare. And if we look back at the Bill Kaufhaus case, which is the one which uh, really put part-time work as indirect discrimination onto the map, there was an argument that we should look also at the division of labour in the home, which the court rejected. Again, we could say this is about competence, but still it's, it's where, we, where we see the EU in terms of uh, substantive equality. Affirmative action is only permitted in small, limited circumstances where what we might call a tie break. So the background view is that merit must be equal. And that again reimports the problematic understanding of merit, which I talked about in the beginning. And pregnancy, as I said. So harassment, I think, is good. I, I haven't put any other restraints on harassment. But pregnancy, again, we need to get back to much more emphasis on rights of fathers. So what I've tried to do then is to produce um, a four-dimensional approach to substantive equality, which sees the dimensions as mutually reinforcing and complementary, and also when they pull in different directions, giving us a way of articulating the tension, and through articulating the tension, working out how to create a synthesis. Um, it's also a framework of analysis, so the idea isn't uh, is as much to say if we want to work <coughs> to what extent a policy is taking us towards substantive equality, we, we can use this as, as a set of criteria and perhaps appoint it towards um, ways in which such policy should be reformed. Now this is really only a beginning, it's, 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 it's setting up some big broad brush ideas it needs to be developed, in, and it can be developed for gender, but it can also be developed for disability, race, sexual orientation, etc. But I've just tried to, as it were, give you a very broad brush view of, of this. So thank you very much.